I'm delighted to welcome you back to our second day, full day, of uh, the uh, 50 Years After Shemp conference that we're holding here at IU. And I think I get credit for traveling the farthest. I flew back from India to be part of this conference. And uh, based on the beginning we had yesterday, the fine talk by Sally Gordon and the conversations I've already had, I'm so glad that I did come back for this conference. Uh, before I introduce our plenary speaker for this morning, let me uh, just take you through the schedule up till lunchtime. So uh, we're in this session till 10.15, uh, plenary and some question answer discussion after that. That takes us up to uh, our short break, 10.15 to 10.30. Here all this is in this room. And then we will have a two-hour session of four papers panel discussion coming out of that. Uh, we will break then for an hour for lunch from 12.45 to 1.45. Uh, I am David Haberman, professor in the Department of Religious Studies. And I say very delighted to be back here this morning. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome back to Bloomington my dear friend Jerry Larson, who we heard last night is one of the great giants in religious studies. Um, Dr. Gerald Larson has a long and prestigious career in the religious studies departments of three state universities. Uh, first at the University of Tennessee beginning in 1967, then after that at the University of California, Santa Barbara, followed by time at Indiana University Bloomington from which he retired in 2003, if Jerry Larson ever retires. He continues to be quite active, as I understand it these days. He is both a historian of religions as well as a philosopher of religions and has worked primarily in uh, South Asian religious traditions. Besides being a dear friend and a former colleague here at Indiana University, he is also Tagore Professor Emeritus of Indian Cultures and Civilization at Indiana University. Uh, Dr. Lawson is also Professor Emeritus Religious Studies at UC Santa Barbara. He currently serves as a re research professor at the University of California, Irvine, where he is currently teaching. Dr. Larson is the author or editor of some 12 books and well over 100 scholarly articles on cross-cultural philosophy of religion, history of religions, classical Sanskrit, and South Asian history and culture. His first book, which was published in 1969, was well received and frequently re-published. Uh, uh, the title of that book is Classical Sankhya, an Interpretation of Its History and Meaning. His recent books include India's Agony Over Religion, 1997, Changing Myths and Images, 20th Century Popular Art in India, 2000, and Religion and Personal Law in Secular India, A Call to Judgment, 2002. His most recent publication is the 12th volume of the Encyclopedia of Indian Philosophies, which he co-edited with the late Ram Shankar Bhattacharya. That is entitled Yoga, India's Philosophy of Meditation, published in 2008. Additionally, a collection of essays has been published in his honor, entitled Theory and Practice of Yoga, Essays in Honor of Gerald James Larson, 2008. Jerry has given us a very intriguing, I must say rather long title to his talk uh, this morning, and I'm greatly looking forward to uh, the, the, the promises and puzzles that seem to be embedded in the title of his talk this morning. It is, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. 50 years and waiting for a second birth of religious studies. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jerry Larson to the podium. It's uh, great to be back here at uh, Indiana University Bloomington. Um, 
Last night, I was referred to as a giant in the field. I turned to my wife and I told David later, I said, I picked up a little weight over the summer, but I hadn't thought of <laughs> I'd become a giant. And then Kevin, the department Islamist here, he said to me, I, say, I see you have a long title. He said, why don't you read your title and then sit down? <laughs> <laughs> so what to do, as they say in India? Um, also, there's a handout. In case you don't know the verses of the Second Coming, it's the last two verses of the first stanza of one of the great poems that William Butler Yeats wrote way back in 1920. And I'll be referring to the second part of the handout on the reverse page a little bit later in my presentation. If you have trouble hearing me, uh, they tell me it's turned up all the way. So if you have trouble, raise your hand and I shall turn myself up a little bit further. The first part of my title as many of you may well recognize, is from William Butler Yeats' famous poem, The Second Coming, which was published in 1920 in response, most literary critics suggest, to the end of World War I, as well as the success of the Russian Revolution. Yeats writes the poem to give expression to a foreboding he feels regarding the emergence of what he takes to be a dangerous totalitarian ideology, the communist movement. In any case, when I learned about the title of our gathering, namely Religious Studies 50 Years After Shemp, History, Institutions, Theory, and the year 1963, the first thing that popped into my mind was Yeats' poem. Why? because I personally remember that year, not because of the Shemp decision, although we had all heard about it when it was handed down by the United States Supreme Court in June of 1963, but because of several other events in 1963. A few months before the Shemp decision on April 16th, Martin Luther King Jr., you may recall, released his famous letter from Birmingham jail to the mainline clergy in Birmingham, Alabama. And on August 28, 1963, the historic March on Washington took place, the 50th anniversary of which we celebrated just a month ago. More than that, on November 7th, or November 2nd, 1963, President No Dinh Diem of the Republic of South Vietnam was assassinated. And shortly thereafter, of course, on November 22nd, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. I was affected somehow, personally, in all of these events in 1963, as a young professional just getting started with my professional career and as I thought about what I want to say in this presentation to you today, it occurred to me that whatever I think about religious studies in the modern state university, or about theory of religion and religious studies in the American Academy, and about the role of teaching and research in Asian religions, cannot be properly contextualized or nuanced without some reference to my own personal trajectory and a sense of foreboding about that time that still remains with me, not unlike the foreboding that Yeats, uh, Yeats attempts to articulate in his famous poem. With that in mind, I therefore have crafted my presentation around three kinds of reflections. The first, involves sharing with you some personal reflections, and I ask for your forbearance in my use of a first person or autobiographical idiom for what follows. The second portion of my remarks will be some reflections on what I consider to be possibly a dangerous or unfortunate wrong turn during the period of serious consolidation of graduate training in departments of religious studies that began to take place in the 1980s and the 1990s, and that threatens even now the possibility of a provincial dead end for our field. Finally, in the third portion of my remarks, 
I want to offer some reflections about what I see as some problematic and challenging developments in the study of Asian religions, especially in relation to Islamic and Hindu studies in our current scholarly work. So that's where I'm going. First, some personal reflections. My motives for doing religious studies had, of course, a good deal to do with my personal intellectual and spiritual formation about things religious. And such interest led me to enroll in Union Theological Seminary in New York City in 1960 to pursue a degree in those days called a Bachelor of Divinity and later officially changed to a Master in Divinity. My wife and I moved to New York City in 1960 to pursue that interest with me in full-time enrollment at Union Theological Seminary and my wife teaching public school, first in Queens and then later in New Jersey. In our first year in New York, however, I underwent a severe personal crisis which profoundly changed my life. My older brother, living in Florida with his family in those days, attempted to take his life by swallowing a bottle of rat poison. He was unsuccessful on that occasion and was po hospitalized and in a critical condition in a local hospital. His family was one unable to pay for round-the-clock nursing care, which he required, and I was asked by his wife if I could provide that service. I spent several days with my brother, and by the time that period ended, I was almost in as bad shape emotionally as he was. In trying to understand everything that was happening at that point in my life, my professional and personal life, I was put in touch with the New York Psychoanalytic Institute in New York City. And after many interviews and various, with various social workers, I was accepted for psychoanalysis at the Institute. And the beginning of my psychoanalysis coincided with my third year at Union Theological Seminary. It was a traditional Freudian analysis, five days a week, which continued for just under five years. The period of time exactly it took for me to complete my PhD in religious studies at Columbia. In other words, my motivation for graduate study in religion was dictated to no small degree by my need to stay in New York City to complete my psychoanalysis. <laughs> and my graduate and doctoral training paralleled precisely the years of my psychoanalysis. I've often debated in my mind which training was more valuable. <laughs> Both, in fact, I have come to realize were crucial for my personal intellectual and spiritual formation. In any case, I had to make a living of some sort to help my wife and me support ourselves after finishing at Union Seminary. And so I was ordained by the Presbytery of Chicago and became an assistant pastor at University Heights Presbyterian Church in the Bronx across from the uptown campus of NYU. For the next four years, I was in full-time doctoral studies at Columbia, pursuing my psychoanalysis five times a week in Lower Manhattan and working weekends plus one night a week in the church up in the Bronx. My most vivid memory of that summer of 1963 as a young and newly minted ordained Presbyterian minister was an invitation I received from my older colleagues in the Presbytery of New York City to attend with them the March on Washington on August 28, 1963, which we did. Actually, we weren't ever even to see Martin Luther King Jr. give his I Have a Dream speech, but we heard it on the loudspeakers along with hundreds of, others, of thousands of others on that occasion. In terms of my graduate study, I was initially interested in ancient Near Eastern studies and was appointed Old Testament and Hebrew tutor at Union Seminary. Very soon, however, I shifted to history of religions at Columbia with a focus on the South Asian sequence, pursuing classical Sanskrit, Vedic Sanskrit, Pali, Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, Tibetan, 
and the general work in history of religions with a focus on South Asia. Eventually, I became a preceptor and then a temporary lecturer in Oriental Humanities at Columbia University as I was shifting in my training in life. In my psychoanalysis, I was learning the process of dream interpretation and the rigors of five days a week of psychoanalysis. It was an old style on the couch analysis with the analyst sitting behind me. My analyst barely said a word to me in the first years of my analysis, although I do vividly recall the day in 1963 again, towards the end of my first year in analysis, when a phone call suddenly interrupted my psychoanalytic session and my analyst spoke up for one of the first times and passed on the message that he had just received that Pre President John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. And of course, as a good liberal young Protestant pastor, in those years when the mainline Protestant churches still exercised considerable influence in American civil society, many of us in the Presbytery of New York City joined the demonstrations against the war in Vietnam. And some of us as well demonstrated against Columbia University when it was learned in 1967 that Columbia had a secret contract for the Institute for Defense Analyses for developing nuclear weapons for the US government. In any case, I completed my analysis in December of 1966, received my PhD in history of religions in spring of 1967, and was appointed assistant professor of religious studies in the brand new Department of Religious Studies at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, the flagship campus of the Tennessee system. The, the department was founded in 1967. The department had three new faculty that year. Ralph Norman, a graduate of Yale Divinity School in philosophy of religion and literature. David Dungan in New Testament studies from Harvard Divinity School. And myself in history of religions with a focus on South Asia from Columbia. The year before, the old Tennessee School of Religion had been closed down to be replaced by a new academic structure uh, in the College of Arts and Sciences, namely a Department of Religious Studies, a reorganization model that was happening to occur all across the United States in the years after 1963, as Sally referred to last night. All three of us in the new Department of Religious Studies were products of liberal Protestant Ivy League institutions, and our task was to do something innovative in terms of the academic study of religion in the modern research university that would clearly distinguish that sort of study from what had been occurring in theological seminaries and the old Tennessee School of Religion. It was an exciting time, and we had the task of developing a curriculum in religious studies from the ground up with Ralph Dorman devising courses in philosophy of religion and religion and literature, David Dungan translating New Testament studies into Christian origins and Mediterranean religious traditions, and me devising courses on Hindu and Buddhist traditions in South Asia and East Asia. We had all been influenced by Wilfred Cantwell Smith's book, The Meaning and End of Religion, and we therefore studiously avoided the world religion's approach typical of the old schools of religion and the accompanying isms terminology, Hinduism, Buddhism. If you look at the catalog at Tennessee, you'll never see Hinduism or Buddhism. We dropped all of that. We were determined to develop a program in religious studies that would be clearly distinguished from the older Protestant theological model under which we had all been trained. And let me say, by way of clarification, that we were critically aware critically self-aware of what we were doing in that regard, contrary to much that has been written to the contrary by Jonathan Z. Smith and others who talked about all of this in terms of a, a Protestant Christian project that was largely unacknowledged. Smith's comment is simply a falsehood. We were all fully aware of what we were doing and why. Very much the same sort of critical rethinking was occurring across the country at large private and public state universities at that time. For example, UC F Santa Barbara's department founded in 1964. 
Indiana University Department, founded in 1967. University of Tennessee, the University of uh, Tennessee Knoxville, founded also in 1967. The University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, one of the oldest religious studies departments in the country, founded way back in 1946. The University of Gent Virginia, and so forth. But let me return briefly to the years at the University of Tennessee Knoxville. After my first year, I was awarded a Danf Danforth Fellowship for travel and study in Asia and appointed a doctoral fellow at the old College of Indology at Benares Hindu University in India. And my family and I spent a full academic year there. On our way to India in 1968, we encountered massive student demonstrations in Japan and even more massive student demonstrations against the university and the government of India at Benares Hindu University. The influence of the free speech movement at Berkeley, which had already begun in 1964, had clearly triggered or at least mirrored university unrest throughout the world. And during our year in India, Columbia University in New York City finally also exploded into massive student unrest that encompassed the entire university. When we returned to the University of Tennessee Knoxville for the 1969-70 academic year, even the Southern Conservative University of Tennessee was in radical revolt. But noticeable also was a strange correlation, which I consider almost an elective affinity between the civil rights movement, which by this time had generated a militant black power dimension, the exploding unrest on many university campuses against the war in Vietnam, the growing women's movement, the emerging sexual revolution, an intense drug culture, and all of these with suddenly and remarkably expanding enrollments in religious studies. For some reason, in the popular militant student mind, religious studies seem to provide a an appropriate institutional space or locus for expressing the radical need for new anti-systemic movements to use the Emanuel Wallerstein idiom of world systems analysis. The killings at Kent State University by the Ohio National Guard on May 4th, 1970, in response to the expansion of the war in Vietnam into Cambodia, had a direct immediate impact on what was soon to happen at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Some days later on that same month, or in that same month, Billy Graham held a 10-day campus crusade for Christ at UT Knoxville, University of Tennessee, Knoxville, in the huge football stadium, Nayland Stadium, holds something like 90 to 100,000, an incredible spectacle of the mixture of church and state made dramatically even more explosive by the decision of President Richard Nixon to make his first appearance on a university campus since Kent State at that crusade for Christ on May 28th. In fact, Billy Graham didn't even know he was coming. He was told two days before that President Nixon would come and wanted to speak at his crusade. Student demonstrations had begun already with the announcement that the crusade itself was coming, but became even more intense when it was announced that the President of the United States would be attending. By that time, our little Department of Religious Studies had increased to five members, including Charlie Reynolds, a specialist in religious ethics, and David Lingy, a specialist in Western religious thought. Charlie, a religious activist at the time, immediately started working with the students to arrange a demonstration during the appearance of the president in the crusade event. And the rest of us in the department decided to attend the event, but not to get involved in the demonstration itself. Unfortunately, David Lingy and I made the silly mistake of sitting in the same section of the stadium with the demonstrating students, set aside for the demonstrating students. It was planned that it would be a silent demonstration with students holding up signs saying, peace now. As soon as President Nixon and Mrs. Nixon appeared, however, the students quickly forgot the plan for a silent <laughs> protest. <laughs> 
they began shouting anti-war slogans along with a variety of unpleasant obscenities. The good Christians sitting in other sections of the football stadium that evening started singing Amazing Grace in response to the shouting students. President Nixon did speak for about 10 minutes over the roar of the students and the singing Christians. Later that evening, Charlie Reynolds was arrested and many of the students who had been part of the demonstration uh, were arrested for interrupting a religious service. The next morning, I received a call from our department chair, Ralph Norman, informing me that the Dean of Arts and Science, Alvin Nielsen, had just been visited by the Tennessee Highway Patrol with a picture of me, <laughs> can you imagine? Me and my colleague, David Lee, sitting in the section with the demonstrators. They had issued two no-name warrants for our arrest and asked Dean Nielsen if he recognized either of us <laughs> in the picture. The dean told the troopers that he had no idea who we were. <laughs> he was a good old guy, Alvin Nielsen, a physicist. He then immediately called Ralph Norman with the advice, tell Larson to leave Knoxville as soon as possible <laughs> since they'll probably identify him within the next few days. Just a couple of weeks earlier, this is what, this is what early religious studies was like in the US. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I'm doing this. Just a couple of weeks earlier, I had received a letter from Chancellor Vernon Cheadle of the University of California, Santa Barbara, telling me that I had been appointed associate professor with tenure at UC Santa Barbara for the 1970-71 academic year. I had been invited to interview that year, 69-70, along with a number of others for a new position in South Asian religions. And it was late in spring of that academic year of the Billy Graham crusade that UC Santa Barbara had finally been able to offer me the position. We had planned to leave for California later in June of 1970, but the arrest threat <laughs> led our family departing Knoxville, heading for California in the very first days of June. And moving from the University of Tennessee, Santa Barbara, however, proved to be even more turbulent and was literally a case of going from the frying pan into the fire. In that year that I joined UCSB in 1970, Students at UC Santa Barbara in the adjacent community of Isla Vista, in which students of UCSB for the most part lived, burned down the Isla Vista branch of the Bank of America as a symbolic act of violence against American capitalism and American neocolonialism. The University of Tennessee Knoxville had been a totally unexpected experience for me of what it would be like in a department of religious studies in a state university, but the move to UC Santa Barbara was a whole new degree and scale of social protest and anti-systemic rebellion. The California State Highway Patrol had more or less taken over the campus at UCSB. The National Guard was poised to enter the campus. Ronald Reagan, the governor, who had already sacked Clark Kerr, president of the UC system, was enraged at the University of California, and I learned that the reason why my appointment had been delayed until late in the spring of that year was become, because all searches had been put on hold from the time of the burning of the bank until the near uh, the end of that spring term. Again, however, as at the University of Tennessee, and going through all this because I think these things are closely related, Sally talked last night about paying attention to religion on the ground. Well, this kind of stuff was happening. The war in Vietnam, the civil rights movement. You couldn't teach the, this stuff in those years without addressing those kinds of concerns on the ground. There was an interesting correlation between religious studies and what was happening on the campus and the surrounding community. Bomb scares requiring evacuation of the university library occurred almost every day with continuing angry student demonstrations in front of the administration building at UCSB, were conjoined with massive expanding enrollments in religious studies. In my first year, I offered a course entitled Yoga Traditions of India. And in those early years at UC Santa Barbara, it always enrolled between 100, 200, up to even 300 students of, of a term. <laughs> 
an interesting combination and distressing combination, a mix of radical student activists, stoned out students of meditation sitting in Padmasana on the floor of front, <laughs> just beyond my lectern, drug addicts of one kind or another, and the endless parade of dogs that, st <laughs> that students that students brought to class in those days, <laughs> who happily barked from time to time, and on occasion even copulated, much, <laughs> much to the amusement of the students in the class. When I asked my chair, you know, I was a young associate professor with tenure sitting there for the first time, I said, what do I do about these dogs in the class? <laughs> he chuckled and replied, he says, just yell, get that son of a bitch out of here. <laughs> Sic transit gloria mundi. So much for the academic study of religion <laughs> and departments of religious studies in the modern state-funded public university, at least in the first decade after 1963 until well into the middle and late years of that year, of that, of that decade. Bob Michelson, now getting a little more serious, the first chair of the Department of Religious Studies at Santa Barbara, finished his term in 1970. I succeeded him as the second chair of the department from 1971 to 1976. These were largely consolidation years when the faculty was greatly expanded with the addition of Raymond Nopanikar, Ninian Smart, and a number of others in various fields, both di disciplinary and in terms of specific cross-cultural traditions. We developed a full curricular program in religious studies, a minor, a major, a full MA, and a full PhD program under the general heading cross-cultural and interdisciplinary studies in religion. Comparable full programs were also being developed around the country in those years from the late 1970s and through the 80s and 90s. Unique to UCSB was our emphasis on primary languages taught within the department, including Greek, Coptic, Hebrew, Sanskrit, Pali, Arabic, Tibetan, Chinese. Also unique to UCSB was a major effort to explore the nature of graduate education in religious studies. A year-long assessment of graduate study in religion entitled the Santa Barbara Colloquy, Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone, sponsored and generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. In addition to resident faculty, scholars in religious studies came from throughout the United States for example, Kathy Albanese, James Robinson, John Carmen, Jacob Neuser, Eric Sharp, Jonathan Z. Smith, Mark Taylor, John Wilson, Clark Roof, and a host of others, all asking about whether there should be graduate education in religious studies departments. The results of that colloquy were published in a double issue of the journal Soundings back in 1988, and I served as guest editor for that particular volume. In my view, it represents perhaps the best single collection of essays on issues related to establishing cross-cultural and interdisciplinary graduate education in religious studies in American higher education. And I know of nothing comparable since that time. By 1995, UC Santa Barbara Department of Religious Studies was ranked among the best in the country and continues to be highly regarded up until the present time. My own career then took a final turn still in religious studies, but expanded during the final eight years of my full-time active career and growing involvement in India and India studies and to my appointment as the first Rabindranath Tagore Professor of Indian Cultures and Civilizations and Director of the India Studies Program at Indiana University Bloomington from 1995 to th 2003. I say still in religious studies since I was privileged to join one of the other major and distinguished departments of religious studies in a public research university, namely IU Bloomington. Although my primary task was to develop India studies or South Asian studies at IU along with a new independent India studies program, my professorship actually was located in the Department of Religious Studies, which I think was appropriate, and with adjunct appointments in philosophy and comparative literature. Now then I have a brief section on ranking of schools. And take your handout, which you should all have. On the first page, you have the poem, the Yeats poem, where, from which I took my title. You can read that at your leisure and try to interpret the poem. It's one of the great poems Yeats ever wrote, I think. And then flip it over. 
We have a lot of data now about departments of religious studies in American higher education from the National Research Council. They've been doing surveying for quite quite a number of years. And they survey each year 171 programs around the country for the teaching of religion. Of those 171, 40 are listed as top rank institutions. And among those 40, 12 come out as, as being the most excellent programs in the country today. And I have that listed here uh, on the second page. Now, notice there are numbers after each um, institution. I, I took two of the criteria. The National Research Council looks at these institutions with 21 plus criteria. I took two. One criterion is what faculty around the country, how faculty around the country rank programs. And the second criterion is what is the research productivity of faculty in ranked programs. And, so, and then I made the list of, um, in, in alphabetical order, please note, uh, and altogether about 12 of them. Brown, the highest among the 40. Uh, Brown, Duke, Emory, IU Bloomington, Princeton, Stanford, Syracuse, UC Santa Barbara, University of North Carolina, University of Pennsylvania, University of Virginia, and Yale University. Harvard's not included, Chicago's not included, because they continue to self-identify themselves as divinity schools, which then makes it incomparable statistically to compare them with freestanding religious studies departments. And the only point, you can look at that, uh, you can look at that listing at your, own, at your own leisure. Such rankings, of course, are debatable, and at best only rough approximations. My only comment, however, is that just four of the institutions are state-funded public research universities, namely IU Bloomington, UC Santa Barbara, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and the University of Virginia. Funding and endowments undoubtedly have a good deal to do with the fact that there are so few top-ranked state-funded public research universities for the study of religion. In any case, much depends on whether one is an optimist or a pessimist. I'm inclined to the pessimist perspective in the sense that it's surprising that only four state-funded public institutions have made it to the top rankings of the last 50 years. An optimist could suggest, of course, to the contrary, that it's amazing that within 50 years, four state-funded public research universities could actually have reached the top rankings nearly from a starting point of the complete absence of departments of religious studies in, at the beginning of the period. In any case, you can draw your own conclusion in that regard. But let me move on now, and much more briefly, to two sets of reflections that I want to place before you on this occasion. And I say briefly, because what, it, what I have in mind can easily be said, and I'll say it quickly, and by the same token, we're here today and tomorrow to discuss these various issues, and I want to hear from all of you, and not, you, don't, you don't need to hear just from me in this regard. First then, what do I have in mind when I refer to what I said earlier is a possibly dangerous or unfortunate wrong turn? during the period of serious reflection and consolidation of graduate training in departments of religious studies that began to take place in the 80s and the 90s. I have in mind what I take to be the implicit and frequently explicit attempt to delegitimize a cogent use of the term religion beyond a narrow Western intellectual framework, and more than that, an attempt to delegitimize a broadly based cross-cultural and inter interdisciplinary graduate training in departments of religious studies in state-funded public universities. I see these sorts of delegitimizing efforts in the work of, and again in alphabetical order, uh, and many of you will know these books, Daniel, uh, Daniel Dubison's work, Timothy Fitzgerald, D.G. Hart, Richard King, Rus Russell McCutcheon, Mark Taylor, Jonathan Z. Smith, Donald Weeb, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Quite apart from what appears as an almost obsessive anti-Christian or at least anti-Protestant bias, what is much more worrisome in these two sorts of delegitimizing discourse is what Robert Siegel has identified as the conflation of discovery with invention. <laughs> 
And that is to say, because they have noted quite correctly that the notion of religion was discovered in certain sorts of intellectual reflection arising in the Mediterranean of the late antiquity, largely in Jewish and early Christian theologizing. See, for example, Wilfred Cantwell Smith's book on the meaning and end of religion and many other books before, and before Smith and after Smith. They have drawn the remarkable and, in my judgment, clearly erroneous conclusion that religion is an abstract category concept that is the imagined invention of the Western scholarly community. And more than that, that it, as an invented construct, it is owned by the Western scholarly community, especially in its quote-unquote Protestant Christian theological project. Jonathan Z. Smith has been in many ways the most vociferous spokesperson for this sort of confused conflation. And let me allow him to speak for himself in this regard. Says Jonathan, Religion is solely the creation of the scholar's study. It is creator, created for the scholar's analytic purposes by his imaginative acts of comparison and generalization. Religion has no independent existence apart from the academy. He goes on. As an aside, I may add that there is no more pathetic spectacle in all of academia than the endless citation of the little list of 50-odd definitions of religion in James Loeb's Psychology of Religion, that religion is beyond definition, that it is fundamentally a mysterium, nonsense. We created it, and following the Frankenstein ethos, we must take responsibility for it. When I first heard and read this prophetic-like pronouncement at our Santa Barbara colloquy, Religion Within the Limits, of reason alone, when we were all working carefully to consolidate and frame in an intellectually responsible manner our efforts to develop graduate education in religious studies in departments of religious studies, and when I have read and reread these sorts of pronouncements again and again from other theorists in the field, for the most part the ones I listed above, who offer the same sort of arguments and who assert that religious studies is a would-be discipline, with at best only a mongrel polyglot jargon, and with a subject matter that has only vague abstractions like ultimate concern and transcendence in its lame attempts at definition, while also wanting to consider itself scientific in some sense. I was at first nonplussed. What in the world does one do with theorists who seriously think about religion and religious studies in such terms? Then, like Peter Berger, some years back, similarly nonplussed by the fundamentalism project, which was seriously put forth with a straight faith, face as a cogent research venture, I had my aha experience. I asked myself, a simple question. What if we take Jonathan Z. Smith's comments, mutatis mutandis, and simply substitute the word Asia as a general category concept? Not Asia as the name of a continent, but Asia as a conceptual category so commonly written about in the 19th and 20th century. What emerges is something like the following. Quote, Asia is solely the creation of the scholar's study. It is created for the scholar's analytic purposes by his imaginative acts of comparison and generalization. Asia has no independent existence apart from the academy. Is Asia beyond definition? Is it fundamentally a mysterium? Nonsense. We created it, and following the Frankenstein ethos, we must take responsibility for it. I can think of no stronger proclamation of the worst kind of intellectual and colonialist discourse, a discourse that leads to an endless and repetitious in-house conversation based almost entirely on secondary sources, obsessed with historical, linguistic, and scientific debates with a remarkably provincial Western intellectual horizon 
that finally loses touch with anything remotely resembling the attempt to understand or explain what Schleiermacher once referred to as that, quote, red hot pouring of inner fire, the fire which is contained to a greater or lesser degree in all religions. I offer in evidence my worry about this sort of delegitimizing discourse, the issue of the Journal of the American Academy of Religion, volume 68, number four, December 2010, that was just a couple, two, years, two years ago, which in part explicitly addresses recent theorizing in religious studies and concludes with Jonathan Z. Smith's Tillich's Remains. A set of theoretical essays, which I found embarrassing, which contains not a single theorist from India, North Africa, Western Asia, China, Japan, Korea, Southern Africa, Southeast Asia. For example, theists like theorists like Daya Krishna, Tian Mudden, Partha Chatterjee, Rowena Williams, Vina Das, Du Wei Ming, Vinita Sinha, Ranji Yu, Ashish Nandi, Tariq Ramanan, and any number of other theorists. And if you don't know those names, you don't belong in religious studies in a public university today who have written extensively and in an original fashion about religion and religious studies from dramatically different presuppositions, published often in American sources and thus readily available for serious American and European scholars. I can only conclude that if we continue to follow along this line of in-house, we own it theorizing, we will end up walking out of our various departments of religious studies, muttering in utter bewilderment Cla Claude Welch's remarkable lament at the end of his study of graduate education in religious studies that, quote, nothing appears in a program in religious studies that could, could not appear elsewhere. It's no, ac no accident, I think, that those who have taken this sort of turn in thinking about religious studies have turned away from graduate education in religious studies, as well as from religious studies as an important distinct subject matter in the modern research university. Long ago, at the beginning of the 20th century, Rudolf Otto argued persuasively that the primary task of the student of religion is to understand and explain moments of deeply held religious experience. He then went on to comment, whoever can't do this, whoever knows no such experience no, no such moments in his experience is requested to read no further. Similarly, W. Breda Christensen comments, let us never forget that there exists no other religious reality than the faith of the believer. If our opinions of another religion differs from the, of the opinion and evaluation of the believers, then we are no longer talking about religion. We have turned aside from historical reality and we are concerned only with ourselves. Needless to say, <laughs> I profoundly disagree and reject the we own it path of theorizing. Amusingly characterized many times by my former colleague Ninian Smart some years back as spreading darkness. <laughs> and look for a second rebirth in the study of religion that revisits and rigorously seeks to understand and explain deeply held religious experience and to deal as well with such vague notions as ultimate concern and transcendence. And I am convinced that it is important that this ta task be properly preserved, pursued <laughs> within the cross-cultural and interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary framework of independent departments of religious studies in state-supported public universities. If you think that this can be accomplished better elsewhere, then I say, be my guest. Go do it elsewhere. But let us do our thing as well in graduate departments in religious studies and state-funded research universities in which we recognize that we own only a small portion of the land and that we are all struggling to discover the rest of the territory with colleagues elsewhere, indeed everywhere, in the world. This then brings me to my final reflections. And I th I'll take five more minutes. <laughs> this brings me to what I want to say directly following upon what I've just been discussing, but now directed to lead teaching and research in regard to Asian religious traditions, and with special reference to Islamic and Hindu religious studies. Through my nearly half century, I've been teaching this stuff now for 40, 46 years, 
of full-time teaching and research in Asian religious traditions, both at the beginning and early and mid-60s, and now coming near the end of my career in the second decade of the 21st century. There have been demanding challenges having to do with how to understand the role and function of the study of religion in dramatically distinct geo new geopolitical and world historic moments. At the beginning was trying to teach Asian religions in the context of the war in Vietnam, the civil rights movement, the assassination of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr., the social upheavals of 1968, the great expansion of American higher education, including the emergence of departments of religious studies and state-funded public research universities. The challenge in those early years was to fashion a cross-cultural and interdisciplinary curriculum for the study of religion that could match the pressing need for a broader reconceptualized understanding of the role and function of religion beyond the parameters of pre-World War II America and its mainline liberal Protestant self-understanding along the lines of anti-totalitarian Niburian Christian realism, a Bartian Barman declaration neo-orthodoxy, and a Talikian Protestant principle idolatry critique. In pre-World War II America, the study of religion was indeed a Protestant Christian project. In the apt words of Jonathan Z. Smith, Smith's only mistake is to have applied that characterization anachronistically. As D.G. Hart, with considerable evidence, has shown that intellectual world ended after Shemp, and one might add after the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. I am inclined to think, contra to some in our field, that we were quite successful in refashioning the academic study of religion in those years after 1963. And by the 1980s and 90s, we had indeed established a significant number of graduate programs in religious studies in major universities that have trained a generation of sophisticated professional scholars with recognized expertise in the religious traditions of North Africa and West Asia, Southern Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, North America, and Western and Eastern Europe. Moreover, I am inclined to think that the books and articles published by scholars of religious studies, both in quality and quantity, are equal to publications in any of the many faiths and fields in the public research university. My knowledge of such matters is, of course, uh, anecdotal and limited to the sort of things I read regularly. But I suggest or suspect that most competent academics who read widely in the academic study of religion would concur in my assessment. Now at the end of my career, in the second decade of the 21st century, I find myself challenged and vexed but wh by what I would call a, gi a gigantic blowback, geopolitical or world historical moment to use the idiom of Chalmers Johnson. The war in Vietnam has been succeeded by the Iranian Revolution. Two wars in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, a civil war in Syria that may soon transmute into a wider war in the Middle East, the terrible tragedy of 9-11 that inaugurated our new century, and a swing to the right in many forms of Christian, Islamic, Hindu, Buddhist, and Jewish religious sensibilities a great recession that ends, but nevertheless never seems to end. An economic system of international finance capitalism that appears to be heading towards a mimesis of what happened to the international socialist system between 1979 and 1981, and deeply divided polities in Europe, the United States, India, North Africa, and West Asia, Southern Africa, and Latin America. Moreover, the blowback to which I refer is occurring in the academic study of religion in our religious studies programs. There is a serious and growing disconnect between departments of religious studies and believing communities. Evangelical Christians, conservative Hindus, conservative and radical Muslims complain, and not without justification, that they no longer see themselves in their traditions adequately portrayed in American religious studies scholarship. We need to listen to this sort of critique and to respond in detail in a manner that maintains communication with believers in our various religious traditions. 
Likewise, a different sort of disconnect occurs among scholars in departments of religious studies. Many of us recognize profound misunderstanding, especially in Hindu studies, and even more than that, religious behavior that deserves rigorous critique and condemnation. But we find it difficult to say anything critical in order to uphold some supposed standard of scholarly objectivity that requires us to be balanced, neutral, and objective, and to always say nice things about religious traditions, even when we know full well that to tolerate the intolerant is to make a, mac a vacuous mockery of tolerance itself. Just as we needed to refashion and reconceptualize the study of religion after 1963 in departments of religious studies in state-funded public research universities, so a similar refashioning is needed now, and I'm waiting for that second birth. In this regard, I have found most refreshing Tariq Ramadan's notion of what he calls the Islamic referent in his recent book, Islam and the Arab Awakening. Instead of endless academic wrangling about the category of religion or the meaning of religious studies or whether there is such a thing as religion, Ramadan argues that in addition to the beliefs, practices, and history of Islamic religious traditions, there is a simple dimension of what he calls the Islamic referent having to do with the basic identity of what it is to be a Muslim. It is a subtle, elusive quality of a Muslim's life linked to the sociology, psychology, economic decision-making, and theological understanding, but transcending, if you will, com or completing or fulfilling all of these other qualities of what it is to be a Muslim that must be understood if one is to make sense of the Arab awakening. I am inclined to think that such a referent is relevant with respect to other adjectives, for example, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, agnostic, atheist, and so forth. Such, it seems to me, is the sort of reconceptualizing and refashioning that we need to do in the study of Asian religious traditions and any and all other religious traditions, together with the willingness to make critical distinctions and assessments of the religious sensibilities and more than that, the religious behaviors of those whom we study, along with a careful and critical look at ourselves. If religious studies is to find a second birth in this foreboding time in which we live, and let me tell you, it's probably much more serious now than it ever was back in 1963, we'll need to do, we'll, we'll need to, 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 to fashion a second birth of religious studies in response to those cultural realities. My career is nearly over. The task to which I refer is for all of you. My old colleague and friend, Bob Michelson, enjoyed the following Zen poem. I like it too. And let it be an epitaph for me, and maybe for all of you, and for religion in general, in this period of a possible new rebirth. Riding the wooden upside down horse, I'm about to gallop into the void. Would you seek to trace me? Ha! Try catching the storm in a net. Thank you.